A very warm welcome, everybody. My name is James Rickett. I'm the global lead for anti-money laundering and sanctions compliance at the International Compliance Association. And it's my honor to be joined today by Javier and Laura Justo. And we're here to talk about the launch of their book, Rendezvous with Injustice. Um, Laura, Javier, I can't thank you enough for coming to talk to me today. How are you both? Well, we're great, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Very happy, very honored. Very stressed about the, the launch of the book. It's, uh, I mean, it has been, uh, I mean, it has been an adventure before the uh, writing the book, yeah. but writing the book is another kind of an adventure. But yeah. uh, this is it. I mean, it's the the last uh, the last minute before the yeah it goes live. Yeah, uh, and, and we're going to come on and talk about the book, aren't we, as well? And uh, I've been privileged to be able to see it and have a read of the book as well. But before we go any further, how's Xander? Well, Xander is great. Uh, he's enjoying Spain. We are finally settling down here, so he's very happy about his new town and and his new life. Finally, after uh, after everything. I mean, he has been moved from place to place for. I think he went to four different countries in three years. So he needed and he needs stability. So hopefully, yeah. we found the place. Yeah, and I think this will come more to light when um, our viewers that will hopefully go on and buy your book will actually understand uh, a little bit more about the journey that you've all been on as a family in, in separated and coming back together and moving through airports. And we're going to talk. We're going to talk about that. But I think it would be uh, quite good for us to uh, maybe just talk a little bit about One MDB. Now, One MDB is is I would say arguably it is. Uh, the most significant financial crime scandal of all time, uh, and and Javier and Laura, you you were both unfortunately uh, on the wrong side of a number of uh, issues around this. Uh, not because of your wrongdoing; it was because of potential being victimised. But for our viewers who maybe are aware of what one MDB is, but don't fully know what what happened, uh, could I ask you to just talk us through the one MDB scandal? So one MDB, it's the sovereign fund of Malaysia. It uh, mainly funded by uh, by oil and, uh, and other products. So it's a sovereign wealth fund. It, the, the purpose of that fund was to and is or should be to develop the country, the infrastructures, right. hospital, roads, uh, schools, and uh, that is the purpose of this particular fund and other sovereign sovereign funds. Yeah. Uh, what happened that in 2010 I was working for a company. That was called, and it's always called the Petro Saudi. It was a company that belonged to one of my very good friends at that time. Obviously, it's not my friend anymore. This company was funded by him, uh, Tarek Obeid, and the son, one of the sons of the former king of uh, Saudi Arabia. That's why they had this beautiful name, Petro Saudi. Yeah. Uh, but it's only a name. It was a private company that had nothing to do with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it was a, a kind of a front. And what happened in 2009, uh, the 1MDB was run by the, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak, and uh, he was helped or advised by a guy that is called Jolo. So they needed money. Uh, Najib Razak needed money to fund his re-election campaigns, and Jolo needed money because he wanted to be a billionaire. So they needed a way to, to take the money out of Malaysia, officially out of 1MDB. So they came up with this solution. They found a company with a very beautiful name, Petro Saudi, that was used as a front. Petro Saudi had no asset at that time. Yeah. They had like four or five people working part-time in London, but that was pretty much it. So what they did technically, they created a joint venture, meaning that Malaysia would send some money, $1.8 billion, and in the joint venture, the other party has to, to bring something. Mm -hmm. So as Petro Saudi had no asset at all, they came up with a, with a solution. They signed a, a farming agreement with a, with a, a Canadian company that had the oil fields in uh, Turkmenistan. But the farming agreement, just to simplify, it's a kind of a lease. It's, yeah. it's the lease of oil fields. You don't get the possession of, of the oil fields. So that was the first step to find a kind of asset. The second, the second step was to evaluate those assets. So they had to find a guy that was that 
could uh, evaluate those assets for two billions. So they found a guy, a very famous guy in the US, Ed Morse, is the head of City, Citibank Global Energy. So he did an evaluation in, in a week without seeing the oil fields and without, and that is, it's, it's a massive thing, without evaluating the ownership of these oil fields. On the order of the, the, Patrick, Patrick and Tarek yeah, right. we, we have the, 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 the engagement letter. So yeah. it was not to verify the, the, the ownership of the, of the oil, oil fields. So they came up with that. Malaysia will bring, will send $1.8 billion. Petro Saudi will bring assets for uh, like two, $3 billion, which they're never, they were never Petro Saudi assets anyway. So once that money was with Petro Saudi, um, what happened to that money then? So out of the $1.8 billion that were sent by the Malaysian, uh, $300 million were sent to GP Morgan for the, for the, the Petro Saudi 1MDB joint venture. That was the, the only amount of money that was uh, sent as a working capital. Yeah. The 1.5 billion were sent, the, the remaining 1.5 billion were sent to, to Kutz in Zurich. And uh, they were split between some, uh, some of those criminals. Uh, some probably alpha, alpha billion was sent to, to Tarek Obey, Patrick Mahoney, and the Prince Turkey. And the remaining billions were uh, were sent to, to Malaysia, to Jolo, and uh, after 700 millions were sent to, to the former prime minister, Najib Razak. So Javier, what was your connection to Petro Saudi at this point? So as I said, Petro Saudi was created by two people. One was Tarek Obeid. He was, he was my, was a friend for 20 years. He was a, a young kid that I met in Geneva in the mid nineties. He, uh, he was a Saudi guy, very funny, very, non-Geneva, very like uh, not following the codes with a lot of sense of humor. <laughs> but uh, his main interest in life was money. So yeah. he, he, he found the connection to, 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 to get involved and to create this scam. And it was at this point, I understand, Javier, you were unaware of all of the issues surrounding this, but you became an employee for Petro Saudi at this point. Yeah, so what happened is... Uh, we were in Asia in 2009 with Laura, uh, early 2009, mm -hmm. no, end of 2009. And in February 2010, I, I received a call from uh, Tarek Obeid asking me to go to London to work as the number three of the company because he, he, he made or they made a major deal with the Malaysian and he needed a guy that he could trust. And uh, more than that, that speaks, that spoke Spanish because there were a couple of contracts with uh, Venezuela. Yeah. So that's why we left Asia with Laura and we, we went to London to work for them. Uh, and little did they know at this point that they were uh, bringing somebody in that was very clearly had more morals uh, and, and was concerned. So um, let's, let's, I think that's given us a really good overview of, of where we're at. I want to come on to the book then. So Rendezvous with Injustice. I um, mentioned earlier on that I've been very lucky to have a free read of, of, of the book to be able to be, have the privilege to come and speak to you today. And it's very unlike any book I've read before because there's a thematic. The story is is how you were tried as a family to be implicated in this one MDB scandal, and the story talks about your experiences, and we'll we'll talk about those. And it moves through the journey of the legal challenge that you had, uh, and concludes at the point being released. But what's particularly interesting, and I, I enjoyed this, and, and I know we were speaking a little bit earlier on how I actually became really emotionally invested myself because it was very unique that, that Javier, you were, you were telling us your version of what was happening from the uh, the point that the, the, the data was shared to the point of being detained and your journey uh, in prison, over 500 days of your imprisonment. Laura, we were hearing the, the other side, all of the parts that, that Javier wasn't seeing, what was happening in the media, the conversations that you were having, you were being taken to some amazing restaurants and for amazing lunches for these people that were trying to keep your husband in prison. So let's sort of take things right back. Um, um, Javier, Laura, the book starts with you when you first meet. Where did you meet? How did that happen? You will be. Well, uh, I think our both answers to this will be quite interesting. The, the, answer, the answer has to be the same. So, well, it is the same. Um, we met because I was looking for work uh, in 2000 and 2007. 
and I uh, found a great uh, financial institution that was looking for someone. And I was hired by his, uh, his partner uh, at the time. Uh, so this is how we met. Uh, this is how I met Xavier. I, I entered the company, Finan4. Um, and then after a few months, let's say that we became closer Acquainted. and acquainted or closer and closer yeah I think one thing I took away from the book Javier is that I think you really liked Laura when you met her didn't you and that, that love I that still I still do I, I hope still so. also, yeah, of, of course so so the book sets us in a nice place because I mean when, when I'm reading the book I'm, re- I'm really thinking like wow you know the this is a an amazing family they've got an amazing life the careers are flying and um, you made a decision at that point, didn't you, as we moved through the journey of the book to relocate to Thailand. So what, what triggered the relocation? So, I mean, for, for me, really, what happened is I was working, I've been working at that time, at least 20 years in the financial world of Geneva. And uh, the, 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 the job was nice. I mean, money-wise speaking, it was, it was great. And it's still great to work in the financial uh, side of the world in Geneva. But we went to on holiday to Thailand with Laura. And we, yeah. like, it was... Uh, it was 2008. Early 2009. Yeah, early 2009, sorry. And it was the beginning of the crisis, 2008. But, but so it, it was like discovering a new country, a new culture, uh, another way of thinking. Like yeah. it, it was not about getting early, going to work, 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 try to make money, bonuses, bonuses. It was like more trying to get a, a normal life, not motivated only by, by, by working as many hours as, as, you, as we could. And I think we fell in love with the country. And this is where your interest started to shift away from the corporate world and into this uh, amazing resort where you developed a small army of animals and you've got an amazing friendship circle. And Laura, you became quite ingrained in the local culture, didn't you? You started some teaching in a, in a, in a local school. Uh, and then, of course, the engagement happened. But at that point, unfortunately, the the the, all, the Petro Saudi Javier were, were, and Laura were trying to creep back into your life, weren't they? Yes. Well, they had other plans. Yes. What happened is that uh, three months prior to my arrest, I gave the the, the, the the famous data to the to a British journalist and two Malaysian journalists, and uh, that's how they exposed the scam. It it started in Malaysia and it became viral very very quick. So uh, obviously, I wasn't expecting to be arrested as being a, a simple messenger. Yeah, but uh, I miscalculated probably the the chain of events that were going to follow. Yeah. Now this is where I want to maybe think about this as a compl- as, as fellow compliance professionals, and you and you both worked in finance, banking, and I have as well. And um, people might be thinking at this point, well, Javier, why did you have that information? So uh, because there may be people watching this, and I know that when uh, you and I had the privilege to speak uh, at an event in Scotland. There were people in the room that I certainly spoke to afterwards that had seen possibly untoward things happening in their organization, but but they were feeling scared to whistleblow. Was that the same feelings that you were experiencing at that time, Javier? I had or we had no experience in this kind of whistleblowing affairs. Uh, I I got into the possession of this data because of the friendship that I had with the with the IT guy of Petro Saudi. Yeah, Stefan. Uh, and uh, at one stage, I was contacted by a journalist. Uh, she exposed with others the way the corruption machine was working in Malaysia. We knew Malaysia. We went there a couple of times on, on, on mm-hmm. short holidays. Malaysia, if you go to Kuala Lumpur, you will, you will have the impression pretty much to go to the, the London of the South or Madrid of the South. It's, it's beautiful, it's modern, it's clean, but if you leave Kuala Lumpur, it, it's a poor country. So mm-hmm. when they explained to me and to Laura what was happening with the money of the Malaysian poor people, uh, I had to make a choice and the, the choice was to give. I could have done things differently. I could have done that through a lawyer, yeah. through some NGOs, but we had no experience. I thought that by giving the data to people that could uh, spread the world was a, 
was uh, spread the world, so you was the, the best solution at that time. I think, uh, unfortunately, being whistleblower is a little bit, a little bit like beer, being new parents. Mm. You can rely on every everyone that will give you advices, but there is no one way to do it. Um, you try to follow your guts and at the same time you you still have rules that you have to follow and conduct that you have to follow but it's still it's still so difficult to find your way and how to expose and you don't realize the consequences yeah because many people will be sitting there feeling no i'm a compliance officer i'm an anti-money laundering professional i am integral i would do the right thing and uh, we'll we'll evolve with the journey of the book now because at this, by this point you you the dream of Thailand is is becoming real. You've got amazing friends, your animals. You, you're doing some great work. Uh, Having you started training for some events, um, the engagement happens, and then Laura, you make a, a decision, I believe, to travel back to your parents in Switzerland, and Javier, the the arrest arrives. So um, I'd be really keen to hear about how that played out, what were you thinking at the time? Because, Laura, you were so far away from Javier at this point. I was trained for an Ironman in, in Melbourne that was due in a few months. And uh, so I did three hours of biking. I, uh, I did some swimming for a couple of hours, took a shower, I was like looking uh, in the balcony, like the, the sea, the jungle, the, the, the clouds. It was beautiful. I still like feeling the day. And uh, I say, wow, uh, pretty much all my dreams have come true. Mm. And I was just expecting the, the visit of the immigration department of Koh Samui to renew my work permit, something that you have to do pretty much every year. And uh, the maid called me and said, ah, people are there. And I, I, look, uh, I look over the window and I saw probably 10 cars and 20 people coming towards the property. And I, I swear it's true, I had this thought Say, oh, now there, that there is a new military regime in, in Thailand, they're taking the renewal of working permit very seriously. Mm. That was my thought. But it was not that. So they say hello. I say hello. He wants to shake my hand. I put my hand forward and I was handcuffed in a blink. They, they brought me back inside the house. They searched the house. I don't know why or what for, because they, I mean, just. It, it was a way for the media. They, they took everything, even papers of our old health insurance in Switzerland. It was just for them to get how much material uh, as they could. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of the, the after they sent me to, to the local prison in Koh Samui, pending my transfer to Bangkok. And that was the first time I could talk to Laura through, mm -hmm. the, through a cage. Laura, at this point, did you have any idea that this was... Um, some ex-colleagues and friends of Javier's that was trying to implicate him in one of the biggest financial crime scandals ever? Well, I I must say, um, when Xavier called me, um, within the 24 hour he had to, or the few hours, he knew it was uh, Patrick uh, Maoni and Tarek Obai that put a complaint against him. Mm. And... When he told me, he called me, he said, Laura, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, in, I'm in prison in Koh Samui. It's, it's Patrick and Tarek. It's true. I'm, I must say, I, I had a feeling that, that this, I mean, this would go further because uh, I know them and I could, I could feel that this would not go in a good way. That's for sure. Um when I took to her, I said, don't worry, my love, I'll be back tomorrow. I just have to go yeah. to, to Bangkok for, for the bail application. I'll call you back tomorrow evening. Everything will be fine. Again, I was wrong and she was right again. Yeah. This is where the book for me really started to become quite emotional because this is where we started to see a number of different sides to what was happening. So Laura, you were fighting for your and uh, Javier's life at this point. Of course, now uh, Xander, you had Xander. And um, Javi, you're only seeing a very small part of, of, of what's happening. You're being told a lot of the information from the inside and obviously very questionable information at that, Javi. You were kept quite private and away from the dealings that were going on in the background, including who was representing you. Um, and, and at this point, then you're now being coerced into making a confession. 
Yes, I mean, uh, I never went to prison. So again, it's about experience. Mm. So I was sent to the worst cell of, of, uh, of Bangkok and I was offered a deal by this fake Scott and the other officer that you will you, you will know in the book. That was sent by Petrosoli. That was sent by, by Petrosoli. I and couldn't the, believe that I was reading that. I honestly couldn't believe what I was um, reading. But at this point, you're a vulnerable person, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, you will get, I, I made a parenthesis, you will get a lot of documents and information in the website that we are building. But for, for two reasons. Otherwise, the book will have been, will have been like, like a Bible, because there is a lot of information. Mm. We will share that in the in the website. And for professional people, you will find a lot of interest, uh, interesting documents. All, all the all the coercion, all the forced confession, every, every proof that we have will be on on our website to make mm. sure that as they have a lot of money because they stole a lot of money, yeah. they cannot block our book. So they can maybe blog the website, but not the our book. So yeah, I don't want to really spoil much more of the book because yeah. uh, having had the privilege of, of reading your journey, and again, it's that interwined journey of what you were both going through and feeling. And and Laura, there was points that you were being really strong for Javier, and Javier, you were trying to be really strong for Laura, but in the background, it must have been so hard. I mean, Laura, you were trying to travel you were trying to build a case look after your son Javier you were trying to be strong for your family so they didn't see the suffering that you were going through yeah I, I want yeah. to I want to, to make something I mean very clear for the for, for, for the readers and the audience uh, I may be I, I'm probably the, the the public figure of the Petro CD1 MDB case uh, I went through some hard time when I was in jail. I, obviously, I, I, I don't want to be to, to be seen as a victim. It was tough. It was very tough because there is no humanity, there is no morality in a, in a Thai jail. But starting that moment, the real heroine of the story okay. is Laura. I mean, at the end, in a Thai jail, I had to only, only to take care of myself, just to protect my well-being, so, so, so to speak. The rest is about Laura's history and Laura's fight. Mm. We spoke very briefly before, didn't we, about the cost of financial crime. And at many of these financial institutions have been and still are being implicated in handling of this dirty money. Now, we've, we've spoken before, and I'm sure we have working in the backgrounds we have and many of our uh, viewers and readers of the book. We know that financial institutions and organisations are concerned. They make conscious efforts to report financial crime, to make sure that they don't fall foul of regulation. They don't want to appear on their own Netflix special. But there's another side to the cost of financial crime, isn't there? Laura, I'd like to just talk to you for a moment because uh, it may have been that Javier was was the one who was being um, who's been put in the spotlight for the wrong reasons. But you were trying to run a family as well as protect Javier, so. What were you going through at this point, Laura? Um, well, to be honest, um, uh, it was, of course, horrible because when you love someone, you only want their, their best. Mm. Uh, it's horrible to know that someone that you love most, like your husband, your son, your daughter, is in a prison. That's horrible. But when you know that it's on false charges because the criminal indeed, you know, charged them on the false charges just to protect themselves. This is the worst thing that could happen. It's like you could scream, but nobody can can hear you. It's horrible because it's such an injustice. And um, the worst was just every day to wake up and think, look, I hope that my husband will still be alive uh, at night, tomorrow morning, because I know that the goal of Petro Saudi would be to eliminate him, mm. frankly, to, to kill him. So I know they had no limits to what they, they were trying to do. Uh, I mean, we can see it with the proof that we have. So it was... It was trying to, it was so difficult because you, you still try to be a mother, but you can't be a mother. You still try to be a wife, but you're not, 
yeah. you can't be a wife anymore it's like honestly you're you're looking for your place trying to fight everyone it's it has been one of the most yeah it and has been the most difficult time of my life and she was for, forced to cooperate to work and be yeah. quite almost friendly with those people i mean every time i i talk to patrick or to to paul or tarek it was um you want your husband to be alive you want your husband to get out you have to do this you have to cooperate with the lawyer that we chose for him that we are paying for him i mean this is in 23 in Europe, especially in Switzerland, it's it's not possible to to have something like this. This is beyond corruption, I think. Yeah. One, I'd like to come back to talk to, to this element of corruption because um, while you know you the, the the book is about you two and your life as a family, mm -hmm. um, corruption and bribery has far more wide-reaching implications. And, and Javier, you alluded to the good people of Malaysia. There is wealth in Kuala Lumpur. But Malaysia is, is, is a poor country, and I'll come back to that. But there's just one, one last element of the book that I'd like to talk about. And Laura, this is to you. And again, we could talk about the book for hours. And I mean, it's it's one of my favourite financial crime related books I, I've ever read because it was so emotive. Um, Laura, the key, po the, the key, the turning point for me in the book was at the point that you knew you had to leave Thailand. How? What were you going through at that point? Um... I'm trying to be not too emotional. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, um, sorry. It's okay. Uh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Uh, now it's my turn. <laughs> yeah. I think um, that was one of the worst moments of my life because not only Petro Sodi had um, threatened me, to take my child, to put him in an orphan, to, uh, I mean, to jail me to just to be an accomplished. Mm -hmm. When I had to leave, I had to leave everything behind. It meant lying to friends, to my best friends, leaving my house, my animals, all my animals that I loved so much, my life, my job, my everything I had. It's like one day you, you step out of your life and you know you're never going to get it back. Mm. This is something quite hard to do. But I knew that was, that was the only solution to, well, to maybe help my husband uh, to, to try to mm. save the year. The and, and, you know, it, it probably was the hardest part of the book that I had to go through. And, and, and it took me a few days to process what was happening. But that seemed to stoke something in you, Laura, because you then decided that you were going to expose what was going on. And that must have taken some real courageous integrity at that point. Now, the the outcome, of course, of all this and, and the reason why we're sitting here is that your, your um, braveness, your courageousness, ultimately got your husband out of prison and, and I'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit about the back of culture in a moment but the, the amazing part when this book all comes to a crescendo and again it's I'm not really revealing anything that's not known but but Javier you find out that you are leaving prison and you're and you're going home so how are you feeling at this point knowing the fight that Laura has put up with you're, you're going home and uh, the, the biggest financial crime scandal of the century is going to start bringing the spotlight onto some uh, quite bad people. So, uh, I, I mean, I knew it was, a, it, was a, it was a big scandal. I didn't, of course, there is no newspaper in Thai jail. There is no CNN. No, the only thing that you can uh, watch is a, it's a military channel. So I knew, of course, I knew. Uh, I knew to, thanks to the Laura's letters, thanks to the embassy and others. I didn't know it was that big. But going back to the, to the day of my release, uh, it's uh, there are a couple of moments in this story that are like like yesterday. I still have the smells, the the the, the, the faces of the people. The, uh, it was un 
till the probably the last minute because I was of course I had to be the last prisoner to be released. Everybody mm. was out for a few hours. I was alone in front of this iron uh, iron door. So uh, the the way back to freedom was very emotional. Yeah, uh, and of course there were threats as well that the that. that you were concerned about but s- s- moving through the book again a little bit more you've got through the airport you're on the plane the plane has taken off it touches down in switzerland and you see laura and xander how was that have been feeling at that point i started crying the plane when i was landing to geneva mm-hmm. and uh, thanks james of course i was escorted by the police to uh, to uh, to another exit mm-hmm. and, uh, and yeah i saw my wife and uh, and my son. And then the, the the significance of the situation, of course, as you are, you are trying to settle back home. You are trying to build a new life. You've been released, and that didn't come without its challenges, did it? Of course, because of the the publicity surrounding the whole scandal. Uh, I mean, people. Some some people think that when you are out of prison, and when it's you are a, free, it's, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. It's, it's just the new beginning yeah. of new hurdles, new problems, new complications. Uh, because these criminals that destroy our life have enough money to continue. Mm. And that's unfortunately what we are fighting for mm. still now. I mean, uh, a fake, uh, he, they did a fake campaign. Uh, campaign press against Zalier, it's uh, it's an everyday challenge and fight, and it's an, an unfair fight. And the book takes the reader on the journey, the hardest journey I've ever heard anybody as a family have had to go through. And you've taken us on that journey all for the cause of bringing corrupt individuals down. And it, it was truly and a privilege, and, and at times, Javi, I, I felt like I was sitting next to you in the prison, but unable to get to you. And Laura, I felt that I was with you on those flights backwards and forwards for Thailand and the power of the book and the way that it's written as the story mixes between between you both. And this really started to resonate with me that actually the cost of financial crime impacts people like you and I, normal people, how significant it impacts our lives. Now, the significance, of course, of the, of the, the 1MDB fund is that um, Javi, unfortunately, you were you were the public face of this, but how many families around Malaysia, around the world, whose life was impacted with the greed of others because of corrupt individuals, bribes that were being paid, just to benefit, to ensure that they have the luxuries of life that many of us weren't accustomed to, and then Javier's course was, was, was stripped away from you. So thinking about then how important is education and teaching everybody around the world about the impact that financial crime has on people's lives? So, uh, I mean, I think education is pretty much everything. If you don't educate people, they will get stuck as they are today. Just to give you an example, today a financial crime in Switzerland is not really regarded as a major crime. You pretty much don't go to jail for a financial crime. I'm not really convinced that Tarek Obeid and Patrick Mahoney being under investigation for the last five years will go to jail, will reach a status of limitation in, uh, in, uh, in 18 months because financial crimes are not seen as bad. They, people don't realize that, mm-hmm. for example, with the money from Malaysia, people have died. Mm-hmm. There are newborns that have died in the jungle because an hospital was to be being there, built there. There are uh, car accidents because the, 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 the roads are, you know, are very damaged. And it's not only about the money, it's about all the consequences around the families, broken families. We have a friend, his father was killed because he, he knew some things about uh, the one MDB. A prosecutor was killed and sent in a barrel cement in a, in a river. Mm. So, so In the end, you have more consequences for a lot of people, you have maybe four, let's say four or 10 individuals who steal money. One of the, one of the biggest uh, money laundering of the history. Mm. And you have thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who suffer from this crime. How can, how can we still in 2023 think that a financial crime is not 
a blood crime because in the end the consequences are that yes it is a blood crime yeah. so because linked to something it will be so going back to education we have to educate people that they have to understand that easy money comes with a cost and this is this is education or this is going back to the values of integrity that we have to bring back to our kids yeah so i mean it's powerful stuff and and I wish we could stay and talk about this because I'm sure we could sit and talk about this for hours and we'd roll into the evening and then into tomorrow. But Rendezvous with Injustice then, um, when is it out and where can our viewers get their hands on a copy? So I the day. it's available from the 18th of February uh, on Amazon and in every library in uh, Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Uh, but Amazon for the world. Amazon for the rest of the world. So we hope you can enjoy uh, the lecture as much as you did. Amazing, yeah. And I, and I again, I've had a privilege to read the book and I would really encourage that uh, anybody um, that's watching this, to tell your friends, your colleagues, please get your hands on a copy of the book. Um, Javier, Laura, it has been such an honour to be able to speak with you on such an intimate basis. I really sincerely wish you all the very best as you and, and you get the justice that you both deserve. Thank you both so much. And uh, I cannot wait to see how the book performs. Well, thank you thank so you, much. James, and thank, you for, James. thank you all the team. The, the privilege and the honour to share our story yes. is ours. The privilege is mine on, on behalf of myself and the ICA. Thank you so much to you both. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you thank so much. You.